thank you. Uh, so our final speaker today is from NXP Semiconductors. Uh, the speaker is Haridas uh, Velakathara, who is a senior system architect based in Eindhoven. Um, he's talking on um, compliance-driven integrated circuit development based on ISO 26262. Um, Harry Das has over 20 years industrial experience spanning across real-time safety critical avionics systems development including type certification, reusable hardware IP core development in the field of wired and wireless communications, system on chip and relates system development in the field of consumer electronics and automotive field. For the last three years he has worked in the field of functional safety including management of functional safety and functional safety architectures based on ISO 26262. He has close to 15 publications in the field of reusable IP design, design for debug, and safety critical system development. And he's going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about ISO 26262 for us. Over to you, Javier. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, one minute, I think. Yeah. So the outline for the presentation today is, uh, uh, I thought of having a brief overview of the standard itself, but I think already been done. So I will quickly go, uh, go through that. And my, the scope of the presentation today will be on, when we map this ISO, require, uh, ISO standard to a component development, how does it fit? And what, uh, what we did in an NXP to take care of uh, such a, a development. So that will be the scope of my presentation. And uh, just give a quick overview of uh, ISO standard. This already been explained. We have a management uh, uh, section there, which talks about the safety culture, safety management, and we have a development uh, section there where we talks about uh, product development at system level or hardware or software level, and we have supporting process there to support this development uh, process, and we have a concept phase wherein like uh, uh, the safety assessment or risk assessment, safety analysis, safety requirements are. Uh, kind of uh, derived and we have also production operation phase wherein the production control or things like that has been addressed there. And if you see the overall life cycle, uh, as we said earlier, it is start with the safety culture at an organization level and at a project level we need a safety plan to start with and then we, then, uh, we begin with an, a safety analysis or, or risk assessment to see what are the safety requirements to be met. And that uh, that uh, turns to be a kind of a, we will get a set, a set of technical safety requirements specification that will be implemented, verified, validated, and we go for a standard V model based development. At the end of development, we have a set of confirmation measures to make sure that we indeed meet the uh, safety goals and uh, that will be in the form of a safety case. When we map this to a component development, we can see is that uh, not uh, there's no big difference other than we can see that a component is get directly interfaced with an item uh, level through a kind of interface agreement or kind of a, we can call this as a development interface agreement. This could be in the form of technical or, or also from a process point of view. The rest all look same. We follow the same safety policy and as a V model development uh, confirmation measures to create all the safety evidence in the safety case. And from a standard point of view, before we begin, uh, the standard also mandate a minimum requirement of, of having a uh, quality management system that is a start point for any development. So this could be on ISO 9001 or ISO TS 16949. And on the management of functional safety, we, here we talk about an organization level safety management and also during development, what need to be done. And uh, after release to production, how do we do the safety management? On, on the concept phase, uh, it's an, an, nothing but a risk-based approach, uh, like FMEA, FMEDA, these are the kind of activity what we do to see what are the safety requirements, how do we can, uh, what need to be done for that. On the development side, it's nothing but a V-model-based development. And on the supporting side, uh, we see uh, this primarily talks about requirement management, verification, validation, configuration, and change management. And here the standard recommend a set of uh, methods through which we can uh, achieve the desired um, ASL level. And on the production uh, uh, operation, we say like a production control, a field monitoring, these are the critical elements we can see from the standard point of view. And uh, if you see from the um, item, this is what we talk about, like an uh, uh, item is nothing but a system or array that uh, get implemented as a function at a vehicle level. And any anything else, 
So only an item uh, is applied at the is it, 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 we can say a safety gold is applied only at an item that is in contact with the car. Everything else is kind of an interface with the item. That means we will uh, we will kind of handle that to a kind of develop an interface agreement. So this is a kind of statement we took it to see that from how does it map to a commit kind of a component there. And fault detection, mitigation, transition to state uh, as a safe state is an item level requirement. But this could be translated to a kind of set of feature or a set of a, a safety requirement to an at an um, uh, component level. And this is what we see from uh, see is that from for a component point of view, it interact with the system or rest of the component to a kind of a something called an interface. It could be a technical interface or could be a, a develop, uh, interface, a process level interface to uh, to, uh, uh, to different level. For a generic component development standard, also say that this can be done uh, something called a safety element out of context in which we assume a set of a safety um, context in which that uh, the ENC is going to be used. And based on this, we can derive a set of safety uh, requirement through risk assessment or safety analysis. And from the requirement side, this need to be uh, could be a formal process, and we need to ensure traceability. And and verification, validation, and since we follow V model, I would say it's that at every phase of a design stage, we will see a kind of verification approach being deployed there. And at the end, everything, what we do, need to be structurally documented for to make sure that there are evidence and there are, there are repeatability on what we do. And if you, if you try to map uh, this uh, uh, kind of component development on top of, uh, top of a standard V model, what we can see is that from a safety requirement, we see that requirements are coming out either from this safety element of out of context or the derived requirement there and all a requirement manage, a formal requirement management in place. From a safety architecture point of view, this is a kind of safety strategy or we need to have a set of diagnostic features that is get allocated from the system and that and uh, a way to do that will be kind of a safety analysis or safety metrics collection using FMEA, FMEDA, these are kind of standard approach we can do. And at the uh, implementation level, we can see we need a set of safety IPs. This could be diagnostic sensor or say sometime uh, some, uh, some another speaker was mentioning, mentioning about a lockstep architecture. These are all kind of additional elements comes in only for the safety. And from the verification point of view, we can say this is uh, it, it has to be a requirement driven verification. Apart from that, we, apart from that, we can see that we do a kind of risk-based assessment for to analyze or to get the safety requirements. This also could be a right candidate also for verification to make sure that the items addressed in the FMEA or FMECA are also get validated or verified in a, in, in a right manner. And the standard also say that we can go for a fault injection testing. I think this is already being discussed how to do that one. And uh, apart from that, a structural documentation of this one, uh, what we do, that also need to be established. And on the safety validation, one part already discussed, complaints validation is the key there. Apart from that, we can see that uh, this, this is the phase wherein we really see that uh, in a context, it's being verified or validated. Say, for example, the mission profile or the stress characterization all this what would be could be an added element in the kind of validation to make sure that the system meets the meet the requirement. And uh, here, so this is when you when you apply this overall uh, uh, safety requirement uh, coming from the standard, how does it map to the uh, uh, and, uh, component? It is not nothing but an interface. Here we talks about and uh, talks about three levels of interface. I would say one is a technical interface. This is typically we can control that through a kind of something called an interface control document. In my in my view, this I could see in an earlier uh, the some of the safety and uh, avionics standard being mentioned, like DO 178, DO 254. They uh, they clearly recommend as such, as such methods to make sure that uh, we talk um, see we we talk through a kind of formal language there when when you're talking uh, when, when the systems are talking to each other. And from a process point of view, uh, it's nothing, we need to have a developing interface agreement that uh, talks about a shared responsibility between between a customer, between a system or a component. What need to be done at the component level and what need to be done uh, at the uh, system level. And apart from that, a safety manual from a component point of view all, always make uh, sense in a sense that because many times when we develop a component, we will have set of assumptions on 
could be in a machine profile or in or on the interfaces this need be need to be well documented so that the system integrator can use that one uh, with the right intention and if you see this one how does this interfa interface agreement uh, works so there is an uh, the standard already recommends a way of working here so here i, I try to adapt a bit on to see that like when we go for a very generic development how does it fit so in, uh, in a typical case, we start with the safety element out of context kind of development for a component, wherein we have a set of assumptions on safety requirement and assumptions on the safety context in which it is being developed. So this part we uh, document in, a, in the form of a safety work product, and that could be also will be in, in a safety case. This will be represented to a customer or a, to a system through a kind of a standard development interface agreement which talks about what is there within the component, what, what is with respect to safety. And the, uh, the system integrator validate, can validate this assumption to, make, to check whether it, is, uh, it can be integrated into the system and whether it meets the requirement. If not, he can place a change request to the uh, component and that could be handled through another uh, uh, interface change request and that need to be validate whether to, whether to see that whether that can be uh, applied or not. So this way we can make sure that from a system to a component uh, a formal approach is being followed and everything is documented and that uh, uh, with a trade of evidence on what we do. And uh, say on the uh, requirement management it is nothing new I would say. Uh, I could say traceability is being is a kind of standard requirement in the industry for uh, for a long time. And apart from that, I could see that the change request or prob problem report, this will happen in any development project. So that also need to be given equal weightage to see that that do not break the system or uh, do not have any impact, major impact on the uh, overall system. That means uh, we should have a provision also to track all the uh, change request and problem report also into the system to make sure that everything is traceable across the development. And uh, see, if, uh, one some bit on this uh, safety analysis part. So this is a, a standard, typically recommended inductive approach or deductive approach. I say, it, in my view, it would be an, a combination of that. Uh, either it's a top-down approach and a bottom-down bottom-up analysis. This together always makes sense to get to know what is, what are the uh, safety requirements or the uh, weak points within the design. So that could that can be uh, covered there. So once you do this top-down and bottom-up analysis, we can also uh, go for quantitative safety evaluation in the form of an FMEDA, failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis to see what are the whether, whether we have a right diagnostic coverage and whether we have a right default metrics uh, from uh, what is uh, required from the, uh, from the component viewpoint. So this also need to be related with the uh, uh, kind of reliability data available if, if available for a component or a period of time so this can be quantified against that to say to say that what whether we have the right uh, fault matrix there if that is the if, if yes that is the, we meet the requirement then we can go for the detailed design or implementation or verification validation if not in this cycle need to be repeated to make sure that we have the right uh, diagnostic measures in the system to make sure that at the end we meet the requirement and on the verification side, like uh, there are, I think, uh, from a very high-level view, I would say uh, we need to have the requirement-driven verification that talks about the functional safety interface, environmental kind of aspects there, and with that right uh, requirement traceability to make sure that we have consistency and completeness between requirement design component and the interfaces there. So. So it's not a pure com functional coverage. We also need to make sure that when when, when there's a decent translation from a requirement to RTL, RTL to a GDS2 or to the final product, everything is translated in a consistent and com uh, a consistent manner. So that is also uh, the key objective of the verification here. And apart from that, uh, since we do a, we do kind of a fault um, uh, risk-based assessment on safety analysis part of it, and that uh, quite of a amount of information is available there. So that's, that also should be used for verification to make sure that uh, all the critical element, or at least all the critical aspects being discussed in the in, in an FMEA that is being addressed there. So, so that is the, uh, 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 so that means we need to see the verification from two different angles. This all already been discussed on our tool qualification. So I just want to summarize here, I think from an organization point of view, what it makes sense to have a something other kind of a reference design flow that 
typically to be established and organization uh, level to see to see what are the uh, what are the um, uh, so tools we need to use what are the reference design flow we have for requirement management design verification or validation and that get qualified once and at a project level we need to address only the deltas so this is a kind of a, uh, an adapted i would say kind of tool um, uh, qualification flow we try to use it here in nxp so we we on the left side we can see we can uh, categorize all the tools in the in different uh, something uh, something would be i think design verification or validation or test and product engineering and also to see the engineering tool like supporting tool like requirement management configuration management etc then here we could under each bucket whether we see whether we need a tool analysis based on the we uh, based on whether there's a tool impact or whether we can detect any error in the tool so that uh, based on that we see that whether this can be done and uh, if yes then we need to uh, we see whether we we get an, uh, a certified tool from the industry if not we see whether what need to be done within the project context or the organization context what need to be planned for a tool qualification and then uh, the result of tool qualification will be need to be documented to make sure that this could be in the form of a kind of a reduced uh, feature set for a particular tool or uh, like a, a, i would say kind of tool safety manual to say that we can use this many features but not uh, a few uh, let's say uh, hazardous feature from the tool so so this is a kind of a flow what we use it here in nxp and uh, as a conclusion i would say like uh, Uh, from a component point of view always it is a, in my view it is always better to handle through a kind of developer interface agreement both from product point of view as well as from process point of view so that will make sure that as a component what we do as a, and at a system level what can, what a system integrator integrator can expect as part of the component and at a component level a direct assignment of safety goal i would say it's find it bit difficult to re- directly map unless a customer comes with an uh, dedicated requirement uh in that context risk assessment safety analysis at component level it could be a right input apart from that if anything uh, like uh, uh, say what we assume from a safety context or say, uh, safety element of out of context uh, this also could be a, a direct candidate to see the what are the safety requirement at a component level and uh, from the uh, uh, requirement driven and risk oriented verification shall be employed as a verification approach uh, and we, we here we can see the standard already provide a lot of methods to achieve the desired verification goal and the tool qualification uh, is a critical item from a standard point of view but we, this can be addressed at an organizational level through a kind of reference design flow so this is uh, end of my uh, presentation i think i am i am, I am within so if, if there are any any question hello um are there any questions online there's one question online um how long is a typical project cycle time how much of it is spent in safety critical analysis and that's from ankit garj uh yes uh, i think in 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 my first uh, first slide i talked to, talked about a safety culture uh, so that mean if a safety culture in place i think that is a place we are going to spend lot of time to make sure that we have the right um, uh, process in place right people in place uh, right competency in place if that is uh, that is that is in, uh, in uh, that is already existing in an organization then it won't take much time there but otherwise assume we start from scratch uh, having a standard quality managed de- uh, development and in my view i think it ta- it can take a considerable amount of time to to establish such a safety culture at least in my view at least uh one two to three years is not uh, uh on okay thank you uh, there's no more questions uh in bristol and there's no more questions online so just uh, uh thank you to have it asked thank you